God's with you. God is with you. Amen. All right. Well, so good to be together this morning. Welcome to Grace First Service. We're glad to be together this morning. We love following Jesus together. We love taking steps towards him because we know when we step towards Jesus, he meets us and he works in our life and he transforms us. And he transforms us so that we can go out and we can transform cities and nations. Uh, And that's our call and that's our vision here as a church. We want to be a part of touching cities and nations. But in order to do that, we got to walk with Jesus and we got to be transformed people. And so we invite you to be a part of that. Be a part of pursuing Jesus with us together this morning. And if you're a guest with us today, come along for the ride. We invite you, follow Jesus, and whether this is your home church or you're just visiting uh, from somewhere else, today is the day to take a step closer to Jesus, to follow him. And if today's maybe your first time here, you're a guest with us, uh, we want to invite you to to take one of those welcome home cards, be our guest and fill it out, and let us know that you were here this morning. Let us know how we can connect with you, how we can pray for you. Uh, if you don't see one of those cards nearby, but you got a smartphone, you can pull up and uh, put in that uh, web link there, and you could do a digital card as well. We're trying to be relevant to this 21st century, this digital age that we're a part of. So uh, two ways you can connect with us. Um, But even better, visit the connections table after service. Let them know you're here. Take your card there and give it to them. They have a gift for you. And we just want to say welcome home. Thanks for being a part of uh, Grace this morning. We love you. And if you're wondering, what are my next steps? How can I get connected at Grace? Uh, Growth Track is the easiest way to take your next step at Grace Christian Fellowship. It's the easiest way to get to know us, to get connected, to be a part of a team, to, uh, to know the vision and the passion of this uh, church. And so Growth Track Step 1, we're starting a brand new round, uh, will be November 10th. And so mark that on your calendar. You can plan uh, to be here. All right. Wow, that's awesome. It's like the Matrix right now. <laughs> I don't know if I even dare say anything while that's going on. Growth Track Step 1 will be November 10th uh, during second service at 1045. <laughs> Jesus' name. Technology is great when it works, isn't it? Hey, good job, Rose. What's that? Yep. Uh, A couple other things just to mention. Um, Number one, something I'm really excited about, next Sunday will be a special Sunday. Uh, It's November 3rd. We will have Dave and Linda Wells with us. Uh, Dave has been our apostolic overseer of this church uh, for a long time. I think it's been about 12, 15 years. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Dave's been the apostolic overseer of the church for over 15 years. We love Dave and Linda. We love to have them in once a year. And we have a special service next week. Eyes on me. Eyes on me. Focus. All right. Hey, there we go. Look at that. Don't they look good? Uh, They will be here, and we are going to have an elder ordination next week. Eric Aish, and we are excited about that. Eric's been serving on the elder team uh, for a couple years. And so we're going to lay hands on them and anoint them and impart something into them. And that's going to happen next week. Um, So we're going to invite you to be a part of that. Uh, It won't be the whole service. Dave will also be uh, preaching and sharing with us that morning. And Linda will be uh, ministering Saturday morning for ladies' tea. So anybody who would like to and it works for you, and I think even if you're a guy and you wanted to have tea, we probably wouldn't refuse you. But uh, ladies' tea is what it's called. Uh, coffee. There's tea and coffee and crumpets and biscuits. I don't know about the last two things, but uh, that'll be Saturday morning. I don't even know the time. There it is on the screen, 10 o'clock, uh, ladies' tea. Oh, that computer is awesome. All right, and one other reminder is Thursday night is the downtown outreach uh, where we go out, and we just want to bring the light of Jesus into our city. And what a better way to do that than the setup in the city center uh, when everybody with young kids and even big kids alike, they all come through and they dress up, and they, they're there for the free candy, but we want to give them the love of Jesus. And so uh, we'll be right behind Huntington Bank, right on Main Street there, and we need volunteers to go out and help us love our city, to bring the love of Jesus there. We want to uh, just invite them 
to follow Jesus with us, but we also want to just love them with no strings attached to. Uh, in fact, we will give them candy as an expression of love, which we need more candy, by the way. If you want to bring candy, put it in that big box out there or drop it off at the office this week. Okay. Hey, look, we are back to normal just in time. Kids, thanks for hanging in there with us this morning. We love you guys. We're going to dismiss the children to their classes. If you didn't get a name tag for your kids or you're not quite sure where to take them, right out that way you'll see the Grace Kids area. There's check-in stations. There's somebody to greet you uh, as you bring your kids this morning. Lord, bless every child, every teacher, every volunteer. Lord, I just pray that uh, future world changers... Uh, would be ministered to this morning and that there'd be an impartation uh, in our kids ministry this morning of the word of God of the love of God and of the calling of God in their lives in Jesus name amen Well, we are in week five of our Transformed series, and I just, I want to take a moment this morning to give you a pastoral encouragement. Don't give up. Don't get tired of being transformed. We want to press in. We have three more weeks of transformation, and uh, let me just say this. Being transformed in seven areas of your life is a lot to do all at once. Maybe you need to just uh, as you go through the process, as you do daily devotionals, as you sit in sermons and attend life group and uh, have conversation with friends, do this. Say, God, what's my one thing? What's the one thing you're putting your finger on for this season in my life? And how can I take steps in that area? How can I open the door for you to work in my life in that area? What are some steps of obedience and dis disciplines to put in place and uh, some ways I can be faithful so that I can be transformed in that one area. And so for some of us, it might be spiritual transformation. Let's press in and let's come close to God. But maybe for others, uh, it's relational transformation. That's what we're going to talk about this morning is being transformed in our relationships. Maybe it's mental transformation or something else. But maybe just what's my one thing and don't give up. Keep pressing in and keep seeking God and say, God, what's my one thing? You know, take that verse, Romans 12, 2. Write it on a note card and put it on the mirror so you see it every morning while you're brushing your teeth. And when you're brushing your teeth, be reminded that God is working in me because he wants to work through me. All right, so this morning I want to invite Carissa Yoder to come on up and share. I'm excited about what she has to share with us about relational transformation. Carissa, we bless you, we anoint you, be anointed this morning as you speak and share God's heart for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. We good to go? Yes? Okay. All right. Well, week five, here we are. We are learning to be transformed. And today we're talking about relational transformation. And I just felt like we have been set up and set up well for this morning. Um, there is a there is a, a pattern here, and there's a reason that this one is after the last the last few. Um, last week we talked about emotional transformation. The week before that it was mental transformation. Then it was physical, and I think the very first one was uh, spiritual transformation. So there is this there's this progression that is going on here, very intentional, and I love it because before we can really um, address some of the things that are going on in our relationships, we need Jesus to transform us personally, spiritually, and then all of these other different ways that God has been transforming us has led us right here to relationships. So I'm really excited um, to talk about this this morning and um, talk about really what God has to say about our relationships. Our key verse is Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not conform to the pattern of that this, what this world thinks about our relationships. We shouldn't be um, conformed to, to what the world expects out of relationships or how the world says to treat relationships or to interact with relationships. Or, um, but we can be transformed as Jesus changes our minds about our relationships with our parents, our kids, our coworkers, our friends, our cities, our nations. As God transforms our mind, it will come out in our relationships. So that's where we're going this morning. Um, I believe that we actually, we know that we struggle with relationships. We know that relationships are tough. We, um, we see it, we feel it, 
Um, we probably have heard the marriage statistics where at least half of marriages are going to end um, in divorce. Not a very happy statistic, but I actually found a bunch more statistics that I found really fascinating. There are a couple of surveys done by Ipsos and Cigna, and out of the 20,000 American adults they surveyed, th these are some of the things they found. Nearly half report always or sometimes feeling lonely. Sounds about right. One in four say they rarely or never feel as though they have close friends or family members who understand them. And we want to be understood, right? Only half of Americans say they have meaningful, in-person, social interactions on a daily basis. And they clarified that by saying extended conversation with a friend or spending time with family members. Wow. Not even half. Only half say, they, say that happens on a daily basis. Psychology professor um, Holt Lundstand surveyed um, a bunch of people doing a loneliness survey. She, she really isolated this, leaned into this, and she says, loneliness, living alone, and poor social connections are as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. I was surprised by that. So not only are our, are our relationship struggles affecting us emotionally or psychologically, but they're actually affecting our health. But you know what? We, we're making efforts. We, we know that we struggle, and we are doing things on purpose to connect with people. I didn't know this, but apparently there are more than 7,000 online dating sites worldwide. Crazy, but people are trying to connect. One of the largest is called Zeusk. Zeusk? Yes. And they say that every day there are three million messages um, that go through their system. People are trying to connect. World Bank states that on average, Americans send and receive 94 text messages a day. I thought that was extremely high, and then I saw my husband's work phone, and I said, that's probably about right. We are making absolute efforts. Did you know that marriage and family therapy is on the rise? There's been a huge spike in that because we sense these relationships are important. Um, there are probably thousands of books on the market that deal with relationships, and I tried so hard to find statistics for this because I'm a book nerd, and I love this, and I was wondering how many books are produced every year um, to help us with our relationships. I didn't find anything, so we will have to just look at my own bookshelves. And I found a hundred books just on relationships on my bookshelves. Maybe some of you are readers, and you know what I'm talking about. There's a lot out there. If we were, if we were even to add up my, um, the books that helped me with my relationship with Jesus, it would have probably doubled. But those are just books uh, for parenting, for marriages, for friendship, um, in, uh, interaction within the church. There are resources out there, and guys, we're gobbling them up because we're hungry for relationships. We have marriage retreats. We have team-building activities at work. My school right now um, has a family game night that they're supporting because they want to bring families together. We have daddy-daughter dances. We are doing a lot to connect. And I would guess that if you're like me, in the past couple weeks, you've either bought flowers for someone, ordered a gift for someone, showed up at a kid's sporting event, text somebody to check in on them, hey, how you doing? Stop somebody in the hallway or at work and said, how's your week going? We've said thank you. We've said I love you because we really do make an effort towards relationships, which is really good. But there's a difference between making an effort towards relationships and wanting our relationships to change and to get better. And then there's this big world, word that we're using today, transform. And that, really, that word can sound a bit heavy and a bit scary. At least it does to me. Transformation is like going from one thing to something very different. It's, it's not just eking along, but it's this big, large word with, with big connotations. And I don't want us to feel heavy this morning with that word sitting on us because I believe, actually, that it does not rest on us. That this relational transformation is not a heavy weight on my back and it's not a heavy weight on your back. And I'm going to show you why. This is, this is really exciting. All right, our key thought for today is this. God is in the process of transforming our relationships and we get to cooperate with what he is already doing. Our role is cooperation. So let's go back to the very beginning, which is a good place to start. Going to um, touch in Genesis just a bit, Genesis 1, where we see something absolutely beautiful 
that God does. So when God created, God created from within relationship. God created us from relationship, and God created us for relationship. So this beautiful picture here, I'm going to read verse 26. Listen listen to these key words. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the wild animals, etc. But God said, let us. Who is God talking about here? Well, the beautiful word um, for God that's translated is actually the word Elohim in Hebrew. And it's, and it's this big, deep, lovely word. Um, and it's actually a plural noun form. So even though the God that we're talking about is only one, he is singular, yet something within his name speaks of plurality. There is, there is something going on of relationship. And a lot of scholars believe that this talking about us and our here is talking about the Trinity. That from the very beginning, as God was huddled with himself, it was God the Father and God the Son, Jesus, and God Holy Spirit. They're in relationship with each other. I just imagine this shoulder-to-shoulder enjoyment, this mutual respect and honor and relationship that was happening. In that space, this beautiful circle, the idea of us was born. That, that our existence came out of a friendship and out of a relationship that we have never existed, even in, in the thought of God, outside of relationship. And then God goes on to say, um, not, not only are we, are we creating man inside of relationship, but we want him to be for relationship. Um, God says, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the wild animals. God was thinking of us in plural. God created us from inside and for relationship. He didn't say, let's make him or let's make her. He said, let us make them and they will reign. That we were created, not not just as individuals, but we were created for a team and for relationship. I love that God did that for us. It is so, it is so beautiful. And actually here in Genesis, we see that God created four relationships. And these are the four relationships that, um, that filtrate every part of our lives. After God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us, they will reign, all of this. It goes on, verse 27 says, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the animals that scurry along the ground. And then verse 31, then God looked over all that he had made and said, that is very good. So the four relationships that we can see here is first and foremost that relationship that God created with people, that, that our relationship with God is the first and foremost in relationship. It was full of transparency. It was full of trust and intimacy. And God looked at that and said, exactly how I want it. And then the second relationship that God created was that um, between humans, the relationship, oh sorry, the relationship with self, that God gave purpose and worth and dignity so that each individual had a sense of self-worth and self-dignity and, and purpose with themselves. That's second relationship. The third relationship that God created was with others. And there was mutual honor. There was partnership. There was selflessness in that relationship between Adam and Eve, and that would go on to bless all of these other um, relationships with others. And then the final relationship that God created that day was with creation. And there was protection there, there was managing, there was intentionality. And after each one of these relationships, God gave his approval, as in, this is how I intended it. There is this, there, there's this idea when, when God says very good, 
I don't understand all of the Hebrew, but there's this beautiful idea of, of, of interconnectedness in the term very good. And so it wasn't even like Jesus, like God was looking at the whale and saying, wow, I made a great whale and that whale is very good or this flowering tree is very good. But God was actually looking at the connectedness, at these relationships and the way that they fit together. And that, he said, was very, very good. That's how he wanted it. Things were as it should be. But then the fall happened, and Adam and Eve chose to sin and cho- chose their own way instead of God's way. And that's when those relationships became distorted. All four of those relationships, their relationship with God, their relationship with self, their relationship with others, and their relationship with creation, they got twisted. They kind of fell apart. But God... And ever since then, God has been on the move. God has been in action to redeem those four relationships. This wasn't a surprise to God. God wasn't thrown off. God wasn't surprised by what happened because God knows everything. And he was intentional about what he was going to do next. And this is what he did next. And this is just beautiful. So there's a verse in Isaiah that I have, I've been familiar with for a long time. I don't know if you guys have heard it before. If you've never heard it, you're in for a treat. If you have heard it before, maybe there's something in here that you haven't seen before. I went for a long, long time reading this verse, and actually it was really important to us in our, in our um, overseas missionary work. We heard this verse, we read it, but I never saw what I saw this year. And this is just so beautiful. So the verse is Isaiah 52, verse 7. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who brings good news. What is this good news? The gospel of Jesus, right? This is the good news of peace and salvation. The news that the God of Israel reigns. So my Bible translates it peace. The good news of peace and salvation. Well, salvation, we understand that. We get that. We talk a lot about salvation. And salvation is very important. Absolutely. We would probably say, if somebody asks you, what's the good news of Jesus? We would say, Jesus saves us, right? Jesus saves us. He takes away our sins. That's the good news, which is absolutely true. But it's only a piece of the good news. There's another piece to this good news. My Bible translates it peace. A lot of Bibles do. But actually, the Hebrew word there is shalom, And this word is a beautiful, fantastic word. Yes, it can be translated peace, but it's so much deeper than just peace. It is used in all of its Hebrew forms at least 400 times. So it was very much a part of Hebrew culture. They they had a lot of uses for it. Um, They greeted each other with it. Here's some of the things that it meant besides just peace. Um, It was used to report on people's health their welfare, their well-being, their safety, the absence of war without unrest. It was used to talk about blessing, victory or triumph, something being without disruption. Your trusted, their trusted friends and family will, were called their shalom people. So like you're in a crisis and guess who you call? Your shalom people. Who throws you a baby shower? Your shalom people. Um, when, they would, when they would meet someone and greet them, they would ask shalom of you as in, Are you well? Are things all right with you? So this idea of shalom is there's this prosperity, there's this healing, there's this harmony that's involved in this. It's so much bigger than just peace. When I think of peace, I think of kicking back and sipping and reading a book. But this peace is actually so much more active. It's an active and aggressive peace, not inactivity, but moving in the direction toward being in complete harmony. So imagine for me, imagine with me that that God is drawing a circle because I think of circle as completeness. Circles signify wholeness and unity and healing. And so in each one of our lives, what God is actually doing is he is drawing those circles. In all of our relationships, God is drawing the circle. Relationship with spouse, He is drawing this circle of shalom. What he wants to do, what his great desire is, and what he is actually doing right now is bringing wholeness and completeness and flourishing to our relationships. I didn't make this up. This is right here, and this is God's idea. God's idea to make all things whole, and things as they ought to be. The the word shalom is never used in the first two chapters of Genesis, but that's the picture of shalom, that as God created, 
things are exactly as they should be. And God's intent is to restore all of our, all four of those relationships back to shalom, back to the beginning, back to the way it was. And the question that I kept having is, well, then, then what is my part? What is our part? What, what do we need to do this morning for God's shalom to come? And if we, if we think about the, 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 the last half of that, the good news that Jesus has is shalom and salvation. What do we do to acquire salvation? We accept it, right? We cooperate with it. We say yes to it. We trust God with it. And then we are willing to take steps. Yes, I am saved. God has saved me. It is his job, and I am cooperating with him in my salvation. The same is true with our relationships of shalom. If we want shalom, if we want God's wholeness in those relationships, guess what? It's not up to us. It does not sit on my back. It does not sit on yours. You don't carry the brunt of that weight. That weight is God's, and he is doing something. We need to cooperate with what God is doing. We need to say yes to the shalom, and we need to trust God to do exactly what he says. I have a five-year-old, and my five-year-old is not always cooperative. Don't be a five-year-old this morning. Let's cooperate with the spirit of shalom as he transforms our relationship. God is in the process of transforming our relationships, and we get to cooperate with what he is already doing. And I think it's really important that we see this as God's, God's way and what God is already doing. We're going to watch a video of somebody right here in our midst who has had a transformational relationship as they have said yes to what God's doing. 1 Peter 4, 8. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. I did not grow up in a Christian home, but Jesus was so good to me that I met him when I was 15, going through some very hard things. It has been his grace, his love, and his mercy that have kept me going till this day. Over the past about year and a half, I have seen how his transformation in my life has not only impacted the greatness and the fulfillment in the relationship with him, but also in my marriage with my daughter, with my siblings, with neighbors. He has just brought everything together and made everything better. Life can be difficult and sometimes what we add to it or what I added to it made it even worse. And as a result, some of my relationships started to fail. The first relationship that I noticed was my relationship with God. I took over, I took control. He, being the gentleman that he is, allowed me to step in front of him and allowed me to take over. I noticed that I started to become too religious in my relationship with the Lord. I believe that instead of following Jesus, I started to literally follow the law. And in doing this, I felt like I restricted and I limited God to certain areas of my life. And in doing so, I think um, my marriage also started to become affected. My marriage there for a while felt this pressure and this heaviness that was in the atmosphere all the time. My husband actually confessed that he felt like he was walking on eggshells around me all the time. After that, my mother-daughter relationship was no better. Alexis, which is my oldest, she's a teenager, her attitude and mine are very similar, so we would always clash a lot. Something that I noticed was I was always nagging at her for something. There was always something that she would do that was not to my pleasing or my expectations. The rolling ball didn't stop there. My relationship with my siblings got bad too. Being the oldest of six, I think I was a little too demanding. I thought I was superior and I had to 
know everything. I had to see everything. I had to opinion about everything. I think that with me feeling that way, this made me very unapproachable. After exhausting myself by trying to play God's role in everybody's life and in everything, um, I became very depressed and I fell into a deep, dark hole. It was during this time, though, that I felt that God was speaking to my heart. Be still. Surrender. This is what I felt like God was telling me to do. Once I repented and I humbled myself and I surrendered, I realized that God's grace has been amazing. After this, all my relationships have been restored and they have been made wonderful. I am now able to trust God and I am able to be still, be quiet, and actually hear the Holy Spirit when he's speaking to me. My husband testifies that he can see an attitude change in me, and I can confidently say that he doesn't feel like he's walking on eggshells around me anymore. Thank you, Jesus. And also, he says that he can feel like there's peace and joy and happiness in the home. My daughter, Alexis, says I'm a whole new person. She told me she can actually feel the love instead of the pressure that she once felt. She says that we actually have a connection and a bond. My siblings can now approach me. They say they see a more lit up face, a more understanding and compassionate face. Instead of making them feel down, they say they are uplifted by me. Every day, I try to surrender and I try to humble myself in God's presence. In doing this, he has been faithful and he has shown me his love every second of my life. Wow, relationships transformed. The couple, a couple words that she said there a few times was surrendered. She surrendered to God. She cooperated with God. And it was God who did the transformation in her heart that spilled over into all of her relationships. What a great, what a great story. In the few minutes that we have left, I am going to really quickly hit on two very, very practical ways that we can practice partnering with God in this idea of shalom in our relationships. It's not up to us, but we can partner. One of the ways that, um, that I feel we need this reminder, I know I need this reminder, so maybe I am only talking to myself this morning, but the idea of simply encouraging each other. There's a few people here at this church, when I think of encourage, their, their name immediately sprang to my mind. Anna Miller is not in here. She is so encouraging. Steve Wagler, so encouraging. Sh uh, Salome Miller and... Um, Leanne Thomas came up to me this morning and just had an encouraging word. You know what that does to our souls? Encouragement is so necessary. There's a verse here in Hebrews 3.13 that says, encourage each other daily. And that word daily really hit me. What does daily say? Daily says that first off, these are for our everyday people. Sometimes I kind of get the idea that I need to encourage our pastors at Pastors Appreciation because that's a big deal. Or I need to look for the person who's really down and out to give them encouragement. But this word of daily, who is in your life daily? Who gives you grief daily? Who lifts you up daily? Who do you see daily? Who do you feed breakfast to daily? Who do you text daily? Those are the first people that, should, that we should be encouraging. Um, there's another... There's another beautiful word um, that's translated from this word, uh, parakaleo, and it's exhort. Some versions say encourage one another daily. Some versions say exhort one another. And there's this other idea that's even a little bit deeper than on the surface encouragement. We all need, we, we all need people that come up to us and say, hey, I see that you are growing your business. Tell me about that. Good job. But we also need those people in our lives who will come up to us and say, hey, I see that you are growing in your relationship with Jesus. Tell me about that. And this word, um, exhort has, has an idea of, of, to, of, of a serious encouragement. 
Yes, encouragement's good, but what about that serious encouragement toward Jesus? And I think God is, is calling some of us to deepen our relationships, to go further in the transformation by taking an interest in people, maybe that we've never asked them about their relationship with Jesus before, or said, hey, can I pray with you? Or what's God talking to you about? Not being all religious, not sounding, um, not using preachy words, but just in casual conversation, taking that and encouraging each other in our walk with Jesus. Jesus. Um, and real quickly, I felt, um, I've just felt this, this word unoffendable in my spirit, and I have had so much fun listening to a lot of podcasts about being unoffendable. And I think God wants to remind us this morning, church, that our job of partnering with Jesus in this relationship transformation, he needs us to become unoffendable. That's one thing he's asking of us to do. To be unoffendable, or to be offended, is to be resentful, annoyed, irritated, angry, typically as a result of a perceived, um, a perceived insult. And as I read that, I thought, eh, I'm okay. I don't, get, I don't get insulted very often. I don't take offense very easily. But then I found another definition, and God really, God really got me with this one. To take resentful displeasure in another's words or actions. Ooh, that one hit me a whole lot different. To take resentful displeasure in another's words or actions. And I realize that I have actually been carrying around offense day in and day out from some of my people. And I kind of had a moment this week where I sat and journaled and, and God was dealing with my heart um, with some of these areas. But, God, I th- but guys, I think that if, that if there is one time in history where we as a church need to pull up this area of defense, it's now that we cannot live offended. There are so many things that cause us to feel offended or to rub us wrong, or people have different beliefs or people have different political views, religious beliefs, have different ways of doing things. And we need to learn how to live unoffended. And my, my first response, my first, my first thought is, well, I just need to become a little bit more indifferent or a little bit more detached. But don't you know, that is not Jesus' way. Actually, God has a really, really good way. And I'm going to read this really quickly. Peter came to Jesus and he said, Lord, how often should I forgive someone? And Jesus said, oh, Peter said, should I, should I forgive someone seven times? And Jesus said, nope, not seven times, but 70 times seven. 490 times one of, my, one of my very biggest heroes preached a message on this verse and on this idea. It was called Love in Action. And this is what he says about this. This is a quote. Peter wanted to keep this legal and statistical. But Jesus responded by affirming that there's no limit to forgiveness. I say unto thee until seven times. I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. In other words, forgiveness is not a matter of quantity, but a matter of quality. One cannot forget 490 times without it becoming a part of the habit structure of one's being. Forgiveness is not an occasional act. It is a permanent attitude. This is what Jesus taught his disciples. That's from Reverend Martin Luther King's um, message, Love in Action. And from someone who had every right to be offended... He had death threats. He had a bomb chucked through his, his living room window. He had a near-fatal stabbing. He had a cross burned on his front yard. And yet he chose to be quick with his forgiveness. Just quick. You know those people with the money that just do this because they got so much of it? What if we would do that with forgiveness? And we would just be like this with our forgiveness. So quick and so generous to forgive people in the way that they try to offend us or maybe they don't even try and we're tempted to pick that up. But I think that's one of the areas where Jesus is saying, if you want to partner with me, if you want to have wholeness in your relationships, your family relationships, your work relationships, your church relationships, learn to be unoffendable by forgiving quickly, quickly. All righty, this... This is really just kind of a jumping off point, I believe. I wanted, I wanted to really, um, to help us understand God's heart for our relationships, that it's God who is doing the work. It's God who is excited about restoring our relationships, that we don't need to make anything happen. So there wasn't a whole lot of practical, but right here, guys, so practical. This week, 
in your life groups, get to your life groups. There's a really good teaching on how to be a good friend, how to find a good friend, and what that looks like. Um, whether you're in a life group or not, if you don't have a life group, there's one right here at the church. Wednesday night, 6.30, you are welcome to come and have discussion about what it looks like to make this practical in our lives. And then for all of you who have these, these journals, there is such good stuff in here daily. Dig into it and figure out what God is saying to you for this season and how you can partner with him in the good stuff that he is already doing. So what are our next steps? Um, consider who you might encourage. I know there are people in my life that God is stirring me to, to be more verbal about it. Maybe I think good th- thoughts about them. God says, let them out. Let those encouraging thoughts out. So maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe actually God is asking you to encourage someone's spiritual walk with Jesus. Maybe that feels a little bit uncomfortable to you, but maybe God's nudging you, hey, Talk to that person and, and see how their, how their walk with Jesus is going. Consider that. And then who do you need to forgive on your way to becoming offendable? I know forgiveness is a big thing. It, it, it is often so much more than just a, a two-minute conversation or, or introspective for, for two minutes. But maybe there's someone that's on the front of your mind that God is saying, hey, start with that person, forgive that person today. And then I would like us to take note. As we think about this idea of shalom and these circles that God is drawing towards completeness, maybe, maybe in, a lot of your, in a lot of your relationship, it feels like God is just beginning to draw that circle. Like the circle is just teeny tiny and you can't see yet the rest that God is going to do. Maybe, maybe there's some circles of relationships that are halfway drawn or are getting close to being complete and whole in the way that they should. Let's take a moment and just acknowledge that God is doing that in your relationships. I have a few relationships in my life that have been difficult. And sometimes it's hard for me to notice the change because it's small change. Like God draws really slowly. But let's acknowledge this morning that God is repairing and transforming those relationships. And then finally, let's invite God to speak shalom into the relationships that we feel need it most. If you, if you are interested in inviting God to, to speak to, into, the, into the areas of those relationships, would you just stand and I want to pray for you. These can be any kind of relationships at all. Um, relationships with your family, relationship with kids, work relationships, even that relationship with yourself. I would just like to pray for us as we just think about God, um, God drawing those, those, those circles of shalom and saying yes to that. Standing is just, is just acknowledging that, yes, God, I see you bringing wholeness in these relationships, and I want more of it. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we, we, we accept your encouragement first of all. We are only here because you have encouraged us first. Show us who we can pass that encouragement on towards. God, you're so good. And God, we think of the, the people who have wronged us and the ways that we can take up offense. And we lay down our offense in cooperation with you and say, we choose to forgive. God, let that become a quick thing in our hearts. Bring us to the place where forgiveness is passed out like money if we're really rich. Jesus, we just take note too of all of those relationships that you are doing the good thing in already. Maybe those relationships where where we felt like we need to push it or we need to make something happen. God, we're just gonna relax this morning and acknowledge you've done something good. You are doing something good. Even if it's slower than we would choose, We trust you in that relationship. And Jesus, we just invite you to breathe shalom into all of our relationships. Some of us are standing here with a relationship in mind. There's some relationships that we would really love to see more wholeness, more satisfaction, more flourishing in. We wish they were different. And Jesus, we just acknowledge today that that very relationship that we hold in our hand and maybe feel sad about or feel heavy about that, you are in the process of bringing wholeness into that relationship. And we invite you, Jesus, to speak your healing words and your words of life into that relationship this morning. God, we accept whatever it is that you have. And we say this morning that we cooperate with you. We trust you in what you're doing, and we cooperate with you. You are good to us always. Amen.
Amen. All right. Well, thank you all. There is prayer as always. There's prayer um, here at the front. If, there is, uh, if there's a relationship you want prayer for or about, please come to the front. If you want healing, there's a healing team over here on this side. And prophetic ministry is always up front on the stage. Thanks for being here. See you in the mall way.